And now what I'll do is I'll move to introducing our first speaker of the day. And uh, this is uh, Bert Williams, who, hey, Bert, how are you? He's there live and in person. Uh, Bert is the uh, CTO of Fonto. And as most of you know, uh, Fonto is a key partner of ours uh, on the authoring side and really a pioneer in the area of uh, making XML authoring just much easier and, and more simple to use. And I think Bert is going to speak today about, uh, about review space, which is a, a key element of the product, and how uh, being able to collaborate on documents and comment on documents has just been a super thorny issue, especially in XML for a long time. And Fonto really helps to uh, solve that and, and add some key improvements there. So Bert, I'll, uh, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you, Alex, uh, and thank you, audience, for for joining us on the the second day of the Tridian uh, Expert Summit. Um, like Alex already mentioned, my name is Bert. I work uh, for a company called uh, Fonto, um, and we're building the both the draft space and the review space in the Tridian Docs product. Um, today, I'll be mostly talking about uh, review space, but um, I will also take uh, some steps uh, towards draft space as well. Um, so the agenda today in my presentation is to talk a little bit about uh, the different use cases and, uh, and, and challenges that we have uh, with respect to reviewing content, especially in the context of, say, larger organizations as well as structured content, of course. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the review space itself. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of what the product is in case you haven't seen it before. Uh, but I spend most of my time talking a little bit about the architecture and the reasons why we made certain technical discussion, uh, decisions, but, but also some of the, the challenges that we face with, uh, with implementing uh, the system um, in, in Tridium. So to talk a little bit about the use cases first, right? So a review um, in its bare minimum form is, is quite simple, right? You have maybe one author writing a document, sending it maybe via email over to someone else to ask for a little bit of a review, could be uh, to, to ask for some feedback uh, in the form of either track changes or as a, uh, as a comment, right? Um, well, in, in a lot of scenarios that will work, However, what we typically see in, uh, say, the larger organizations is that it actually is a little bit more complex than, uh, than that. So first of all, there could be many authors actually involved here, um, as well as, as a whole bunch of reviewers, right? So as uh, Arpita yesterday already mentioned during uh, the, one of the first presentation, is that dealing with fragmentation is actually a big problem. And the same goes for review, right? So in review, um, the people who actually need to perform that review, they may be fragmented as well, right? They may be distributed across the, uh, the organization. Um, so they could be, for example, in a marketing bar department, maybe uh, one of the review reviewers is in the legal department, et cetera. However, that's not where it ends. Um, what we typically see is that review is not just uh, within the, the scope, let's say, um, of one particular organization. Usually, it even spans across multiple organizations. Um, and it can actually be pretty much a global effort as well. And to give you a little bit of, um, of, of, of an example on that one is, uh, is, is the use case that we typically see in, uh, let's say, standardization. So in standardization, we have typically have a group of authors called a working committee. Those are experts from uh, the field, and they write a uh, typically a newer version of, a, uh, of an existing standard. So they really update the content, right? Um, at some point in time, they're done, they're happy with their work. Um, but of course, uh, in standardization, um, we also need to go through a quite an elaborate review cycle. Um, and then, I get, yeah, uh, to, to talk a little bit about that, um, the review cycle is actually quite complex in standardization because it's not just a bunch of experts that need to review the document, 
uh, it's actually all the members of uh, of an international standardization organization, for example. And it could actually be uh, one per country, right? So uh, maybe you have, I don't know, upwards of a uh, of hundred members contributing their expertise to a uh, to, to to say the the standardization body um but even on on say a national level so on an individual member level uh the number of reviewers that may need to review uh, to review the standard can actually be more than one so um if we have like a hundred countries let's say right and each of them Contrib uh, they they involve 10, uh, 10 natural experts, let's say. Then we're talking really about a thousand reviewers easily, right? Um, so, yeah, dealing with that fragmentation, dealing with that volume is actually quite a uh, quite an interesting uh, problem to tackle. Um, and the volume is not just in the number of authors uh, or sorry, a number of reviewers. Um, it is actually also in the number of comments that they generate, right? If you ask like a thousand people on their opinion, you can imagine that it will take, uh, well, they, 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 they will certainly give that opinion and that will yield into uh, quite a lot of uh, comments that circle back to the, uh, to the authors or as they're called in standardization, the, the working group. So key challenge is, is dealing with all of that, uh, the, that volume of, of comments and reviewers, but also uh, maybe even more important is that the review, the review space product actually need to scale in terms of being able to support that very simple use case that I just described, right? So the one, one author, one re reviewer uh, use case, all the way to these very intricate uh, reviews uh, scenarios that we see in, in, in standardization, uh, for example. So that's definitely uh, a, a big challenge for us that, uh, that we had to deal with. Then, of course, we're not talking about a single document, right? It's not just a Word file that's, that's floating around or a PDF or whatever. We're talking about actual structured content. So it's not just a single uh, document. It's really a whole bunch of components. And those uh, those those uh, publications uh, that are made up of those components, they they tend to be quite uh, quite large. Um, yeah, and what typically also happens with structured content, it is not just one publication that you're thinking about, right? So if you think about maybe a product, maybe there are different versions of that product. Maybe uh, all of that content is in motion. And that is, I guess, why uh, why most users uh, actually start to uh, work with Tridian is because that system is actually designed and capable of handling all of those complex uh, relationships, all of those complex workflows on the individual component level. Um, so what was important to us is, is to be able to say, well, you can review your content with no matter how many reviewers you have. But at the same time, the author should also be able to either start addressing all of those uh, those comments already, um, but also um, to start authoring maybe on different sections that make uh, up of the that, that that are part of the same publication, uh, but are not necessarily ready for review yet. Right. So we really want to achieve that parallelism, as I uh, I, I usually call this, right? So the ability for reviewers to work in parallel, but also the authors and the reviewers to work in parallel. So that was a big uh, big challenge uh, for us as well when we designed the uh, uh, review space. As mentioned, the workflows tend to be quite different um, between different organizations, but sometimes even within the same organization, right? Uh, we talked a little bit about use case for a single author, a single reviewer, all the way to the hundreds of reviewers. Um, then we haven't covered a couple of things, right? So privacy requirements is uh, is an important one, uh, certainly nowadays. Um, and for an example, if you think about a blind review, right? So where uh, the reviewer is not uh, supposed to know who the author is, but also if the reviewer creates a comment, the author should not be able to see the name of the reviewer to, to prevent uh, them to influence each other directly, right? 
Um, so that that is an example of a requirement that we see in the in the area of privacy that uh, that comes up in review cycles. Typically speaking, we also need to talk about the uh, approval workflow. So. Um, is the reviewer also uh, required to approve maybe the content that he or she reviewed, right? Uh, there could be numbers of cases uh, in there as well that are uh, specific. And of course, for traceability, um, and an example here is, um, is, is the ability to show evidence of how a comment was addressed. And in fact, for example, again, in standardization, um, that's actually a core requirement of the entire uh, authoring process. It is required to be able to give evidence of how a particular comment was addressed, whether it was uh, rejected as, as not relevant or whether a change was made in the document due to that particular comment. And that yields a whole bunch of, uh, of requirements. So first of all, being intuitive, right? If we have thousands of reviewers out there, it's not feasible to train them. Um, so the reviewers should be able to get into the system, provide their feedback, write their comments, et cetera, and then get out, do what they do best. And of course, efficiency is also something that is, uh, that is quite important, right? And then efficiency, is in terms of uh, being able to, to achieve that parallel workflow, like, uh, like we already talked about, but also um, in terms of, of efficiently handling all that feedback that you, that you get in as an author. And to give a little bit of an example, we had a, a medical devices uh, a customer at one point in time. They, um, they lost a, uh, the uh, license to sell a particular product in a particular country, and it was uh, there were many problems in that organization, but it was partly due, due to a sequential workflow where the author needed to finish all the work, then one reviewer needed to review, then the second review, and that took too much time. Um, and that's why the authority decided to, uh, to, to revoke that license. So speed, um, time to market, if you will, is of course of the utmost importance. And, and that means that we need to make those review cycles efficient as well. So introducing review space. Um, review space is a secure online environment uh, where reviewers can actually review a document, right? It's easy as that, uh, at least it is as easy as it sounds. They can get log into the system um, and uh, provide start providing the feedback by making a selection uh, on the text, for example, and say, I want to comment on this, or I want to make a suggestion on how to improve this particular piece of content. It is collaborative, so that means that um, if you set it up that way, that uh, multiple users can see each other's comments in order to prevent duplicate comments being reported back to the author. It is definitely set up to, to support those large scale uh, review scenarios that we, uh, we talked about. Um, but another aspect of the review space implementation is actually the ability to efficiently address all that feedback, right? And that is an author talk, so of course. That is taking in all of that feedback and figure out what you want to do with it. You want to maybe want to ignore some uh, comments, but the other ones do make sense and you want to apply them to the content that you're currently uh, working on. And as a result, um, and this is a little bit touching on the architecture, and I'll elaborate that on that uh, quite a bit in a couple of slides. Uh, but we separated the comments from the actual content, and that has uh, uh, several benefits. In terms of the comment gathering interface, so this is really the portion that is exposed to reviewers. Um, we have the ability to create uh, so-called comments. We have the ability to create uh, suggestions, or sometimes we call them change proposals. Um, and of course, uh, the, 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 the most important part is that it's an intuitive experience. Uh, we can, uh, we have an onboarding message in there. So it's, it's really, uh, really easy to get started and, uh, and jump right into that, uh, the content that you need to, uh, review. It also supports things like being able to comment on, uh, images, figures, tables, all of that stuff is, uh, is common, uh, covered. 
or you can even uh, provide global feedback, as we call it. So maybe you don't have a specific uh, something to say about a specific section or maybe a specific sentence. Maybe it's just a general remark uh, on the whole publication that is also supported in this uh, in review space. The addressing side of things is um, is integrated directly inside the draft space interface. So draft space is really the editing environment. That is where authors uh, work on the structured content that they uh, that they tend to write. Um, we did that for efficiency reasons. So um, as you can see in the screenshot on the on the right, we have a what we call a a, um, a sidebar here. Um, that sidebar displays the existing comments that uh, that are available, um, and right from that particular interface, the author can start to address that uh, that feedback. Um, of course, the, it's not just in a sidebar. Uh, we actually have a relationship with the content, so you have two way two way navigation between the content and the uh, the comment itself. Um, so whatever works uh, best for you as an author, you can uh, adapt that particular workflow. So to talk a little bit about uh, what others do when they uh, when it comes to implementing such a, uh, a review system or a comment gathering system. So typically speaking, the comments are stored within the content itself. Uh, that's the way how Microsoft Word does it as well. For example, uh, many of our competitors store them in, in XML documents as processing instructions or sometimes even separate XML elements. Um, and just the, the, the drawback of that approach is that it basically forces you to take a look on that particular piece of content, right? Because you're actually editing that content in a certain sense because you are modifying the XML structure. You're inserting those processing instructions, for example. Um, and that basically forces you into that sequential workflow, right? So if one author checked out the document, a reviewer cannot get in in order to create the comment and vice versa. Uh, leading to that sequential workflow. Um, the, furthermore, the, 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 this particular approach uh, is sensitive to information loss. If you accept a comment, for example, um, or a suggestion, track changes in Word, for example, um, all of that information is lost uh, in time, um, and, and that violates the, the, the ability to be able to report reliably on that. So to talk a little bit about what we do differently, as I mentioned before, we store the comments separately from the, the content, and that will actually allow that the parallel review scenario. And of course, if you can do the parallel review, you can also do the parallel uh, authoring as well. Um, and surprisingly, uh, that allows us to, to basically maintain a separate database. Um, that database, uh, well, if it's set up, of course, uh, properly, and in the case of Tridia, of course it is, um, it is actually impossible to lose any information. All that information is at all times securely stored in the database and it's accessible as individual entities, if you will. Of course, uh, what we still need to do is to be able to relate a comment to the exact position in the document, right? So if you have a sentence and as a reviewer, you commented on a particular word within that sentence, you want to make sure that that location is actually stored as part of the comments. Um, as an author, if you then uh, see the comment coming in, we still know or the system still knows where the exact location was in the content on which the, com the, the comment applies. But there's inherent problem um, in that model, right? Uh, because what happens if you then update the content? Won't the position be, be out of sync? And if you think that, you would actually be, uh, be right. Um, that's definitely uh, one of the problems that uh, that we faced. Um, however, we managed to 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 solve that problem by by applying a couple of uh, smart tricks. So, the key component here is that we, for each individual comment, we actually don't just store one position, but we actually store 
for each revision of the content, we store a position. So if you look at this diagram, um, I use version uh, or revision 1.0 as say the, uh, the revision on which the, the comment was created originally. So at that point in time, we still know it is exactly at that particular location. However, if you uh, if you look at the version two, and I'm hope uh, hoping that is actually uh, good for, uh, is, is visible on the on the screen as well. Uh, but in version two, you can see that the 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 top sentence actually got moved down because presumably some content was inserted above it. Um, and this is just showing two revisions of that content, but we can do this for practically speaking, an infinite number of uh, revisions, right? So for each revision, we exactly know where that comment is in that specific uh, revision of the content. But of course, then the problem becomes something different, right? So how do you know, if you create a new revision of the content, how do you know where the where that position is, right? Um, so we actually have a couple of mechanisms to deal with that. The first mechanism is called uh, active position tracking. Um, I already introduced this in the introduction slide, uh, but uh, we as a company also do the draft space implementation, which is the editor. Um, since we have that, uh, we also have that technology in hand, we can actually actively track the position. So what we do is we create those positions within the XML structure uh, that is driving uh, the, our user interface. Um, and if you start to make changes, um, then what we do is we recognize those changes and then start to update the positions accordingly. So to give you a little bit of an intuitive example, imagine that we have a sentence um, and at the end of the sentence, maybe the last words or something, there is a comment, okay? Now, if you start to type in front of that sentence, um, it makes sense that for every character that you type, the position of the comment needs to be moved one uh, position to the right to compensate for that newly inserted character, right? Um, and that's actually, actually how active position tracking works. Um, and we do this for all kinds of modifications, whether it's an insert of an element, whether it is a uh, deletion, all of that stuff is, uh, is tracked in that same way. Of course, uh, if the author then saves um, the content, effectively creating that new revision, right? Um, at that point in time, we also store the updated positions for each individual comment for that specific version. But of course, it may not always be the case that the um, uh, that the change is made in draft space, right? Um, the content may be modified. It may be some of our competitor tools. Um, it may be modified by an external uh, automated system like an XSLT or whatever. Um, in that case, uh, we have a second uh, trick up our sleeve, which is called position recovery. And position recovery works by comparing the last uh, the last revision of the content for which we have a position. We compare it to the revision where we don't have a position yet. Um, that comparison yields a so-called edit script. And an edit script is essentially a, um, is a list of all the changes that have been made from that first revision to the second revision. Based on that added script and based on those operations that uh, that are in there, we can actually do the same composition mechanism that we use for the uh, active position tracking. Um, and to that extent, we developed our own uh, diffing algorithm called FDIF. Um, and the reason why we did that is that uh, most XML diffing tools are based on identifiers in order to recognize moves. However, if you think about it, if you start to reorganize your content, you just cut and paste some sentences around, right? It's very messy. Those identifiers will be lost. FDIF works differently. FDIF uses the uh, similarity of text in order to recognize 
the the moves of say sentences across the uh, underlying XML document. Now, I can talk for hours on this particular subject, uh, but this is just scratching the surface. Um, and the last technique is um, is the ability to time travel, which sounds very cool, uh, but actually it is um, a uh, a necessity here because what can happen is is that there may not even be a valid position in the tar in the in the latest revision of the document, right? So imagine that we have a comment on a sentence, but the entire sentence got deleted somehow, right? In that particular case, where does the comments uh, fit within the uh, within the, the the latest revision? It doesn't really, right? So what uh, Richard Space has, and it sounds a little bit morbid, but we have the uh, the tombstone icon to signal well there are comments here, but they don't have a valid position anymore. Um, and if you click that particular tombstone icon, what will happen is is that you get this dialog uh, popping up. And what the dialogue actually displays is the content at the revision or on which the particular comment was created, right? So that was essentially you travel back in time to look at the content through the eyes of the reviewer. So you can exactly see what the reviewer saw at the time that he or she created that comment. And that will help with the scenario where, for example, the entire paragraph uh, got deleted. Um, and based on that information, uh, as an author, you can make an informed decision whether that is a uh, that's a proper um, uh, whether the comment is still relevant or whether you can safely ignore that. Well, to summarize, um, well, we clearly talked about different workflows uh, for review. Um, they differ widely, certainly between different organizations, sometimes even within the organization. Uh, we talked about the need for parallel review in order to achieve that efficiency, in order to uh, beat the time to market. Um, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the, the underlying architecture of uh, draft, uh, sorry, of review space uh, to store the comments separately from the content. Um, and we talked about the position tracking to solve the position positioning problem. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention. Um, let me go ahead and take a look and see if there are any questions. Right, there's one question uh, by, by, by Rob. Um, we're finding that, uh, that some SMEs are confused when viewing the rendering of the raw topic rather than the published version of the same content. Any plans uh, to enable us to manipulate the XML prior? Uh, it's growth prior. Um, where is it? Ah, uh, prior uh, to viewing the topics in review space. Um, that is definitely something we, uh, we are considering. Um, it is uh, on our roadmap. Um, however, the problem is, is very interesting uh, to be able to map those comments back, right? So if you transform your content to say HTML or maybe even a PDF or Word file for that matter, right? Um, it is interesting to figure out how to actually map those positions of those comments back to the XML, right? Because you, that information may have been lost. Uh, we have a couple of ideas floating around on how to actually achieve that. Um, but um, yeah, it requires definitely a little bit of work and engineering to get that uh, that up and running. Uh, but yeah, it certainly is on the on our radar. But uh, yeah, like like uh, Joe also replied in the comments, uh, there's also a point to make to say, well, the review space is is really intended just for the more uh, semantical review or maybe the source content review of uh, of of that uh, of that structured content. It's not necessarily the case that you already have a publication style sheet, right? It may be the case that you don't even know, or maybe there are multiple presentations out there, right? If you think about multi-channel publishing. So dealing with all of those scenarios and edge cases is definitely something uh, we are exploring. Uh, but but yeah, it's not necessarily the case that we will actually implement all of that, if that makes sense. Um, and also, there is a question again from Rob. If my understanding is correct, reviewer comments are stored against the publication rather than topics. Am I correct? 
Um, no, not precisely. The, um, the comments are stored against the topic, uh, but however, the topic, of course, is in the context of, say, a larger, in data terms, a map or a, a larger publication, right? So all of that stuff uh, ties to ties together. But we actually know on which topic uh, it, it, it got created. And there's a question from Julie. If a topic is used in multiple publications, will a comment made in one publication also appear in the other publications? Um, I think by default it will. Um, however, you could use some filtering options to, to disable that capability if that uh, is not something you want. But I guess you reuse it for, uh, for a reason, right? So probably the comment still applies in, in a different publication as well.